Chapter 12. The Battle of Antietam, Sharpsburg repurposes the war and fills Shepherdstown structures with 5,000 wounded and the echoes of indelible memories. Just before Antietam, when the Confederate troops passed over into Maryland, Davis Shepherd Jr. rode to Carneysville to meet them and came into Shepherdstown at the head of the army on his beloved horse, Ginny. A soldier among soldiers once more, though armed only with a riding whip, the weight of his oath of neutrality seemed for a time lifted from him. War ravaged the fields of Virginia, harvesting men, remnants strewn as General Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson coordinated a series of stunning reversals on the poorly led men fighting for the Union cause. Then, Lee boldly calculated to move his 70,000 men across the Potomac River at White's Ford and other fords the first week of September into the north. He hoped to carry the momentum to a negotiated separation of the United States for the Confederacy by demoralizing and swaying voters in the northern states as they planned to vote for new congressmen in November. Virginia needed to recover and harvest its grain. Lee may have known also that England had already placed on its agenda a decision on whether to throw its weight and domination of the seas in favor of a disuniting of the United States, pending the results of fighting on the battlefields of Maryland. The deciding stage was set. But Lee grimly knew that his best fighters, who were with him on that hot, dry September, could not last in the long war against the North's deep resources and manpower. He played all his cards that September. This, Lee felt, was the last best chance for the South to strike a winning blow. The dragons are approaching. September 1862 was in the skies of the Almanac, but August still reigned in ours. It was hot and dusty. The railroads in the Shenandoah Valley had been torn up. The bridges had been destroyed. Communication had been made difficult. And Shepherdstown, cornered by the bend of the Potomac, lay as if forgotten in the bottom of somebody's pocket. We were without news or knowledge, except when some chance traveler would repeat the last wild and uncertain rumor that he had heard. We had passed an exciting summer. Winchester had changed hands more than once. We had been in the Confederacy and out of it again, and were now waiting in an exasperated state of ignorance and suspense for the next move in the great game. Surprised that the 12,700-man garrison at Harper's Ferry was not evacuated to be closer to Washington, Lee daringly decided to capture the garrison, entailing Lee's breaking up of his army, which had dwindled down to just 40,000 from the 70,000 ten days prior. Men were exhausted, filthy, only semi-clad, and would at times just lay down on grass and die. Lee sent more than half his army towards Harper's Ferry, less than 17 miles away, but in three very different directions to encircle the garrison commanded by a fusty general named Dixon Miles. Stonewall Jackson led the force of 28,000. Some of Jackson's men coming to Harper's Ferry from the west passed through Shepherdstown. We found ourselves on Saturday morning, September 13th, surrounded by a hungry horde of lean, dusty, tattered demalions 
who seemed to rise from the ground at our feet. I did not know where they came from or to whose command they belonged. I have since been informed that General Jackson recrossed into Virginia at Williamsport and hastened to Harper's Ferry by the shortest roads. This would take him south of us, and our haggard apparitions were perhaps a part of his force. They were stragglers at all events, professionals, some of them, but some worn out by the incessant strain of that summer. When I say that they were hungry, I convey no impression of the gaunt starvation that looked from their cavernous eyes. All day they crowded to the doors of our houses with always the same drawling complaint. I've been a marching and a fighting for six weeks steady and I wish you'd please to give me a bite to eat. Their looks bore out their statements, and when they told us they had clean gin out, we believed them and went to get what we had. They could be seen afterward asleep in every fence corner and under every tree, but after a night's rest, they pulled themselves together somehow and disappeared as suddenly as they had come. If the federal commander, General George B. McClellan, ever knew that Lee, located just a short march to the west from his own 80,000 men encamped around Frederick, Maryland, had scattered his much smaller army across 50 square miles with a river dividing it, Lee would have been doomed, one would think. But McClellan, in fact, did learn all about Lee's situation at just the right time to act, but Lee survived. The order that Lee shared with three division commanders on September 9th was being avidly read by General McClellan in Frederick's Marketplace by noon on September 13th. Two privates using an abandoned once Confederate campsite near Bucky's Town saw in the debris what looked like cigars wrapped in paper. Of course, it turned out the paper was far more important than the cigars. At last, now I know what to do. Here is a paper with which, if I cannot whip Bobby Lee, I will be willing to go home, McClellan famously said to General John Gibbon nearby. It became one of the most dramatic battles because Jackson's men had to capture Harper's Ferry's 12,700 men in almost no time allowed and make the day-long march back to Lee's army fragment at Sharpsburg before Lee's fragment army was wiped out by McClellan's witty advancing army of 87,000. In fact, hastened by the information from the found lost order, the very first of McClellan's men to cross the Antietam Creek to Sharpsburg did so a bare three hours after the last of Lee's men. And the Federals perhaps surprising the Confederates with their celerity, fought and beat the rear guard Confederates all across South Mountain, the north-south ridge, separating the two armies as they advanced. A Confederate wounded began arriving at Pack Horse Ford just below the sleepy Virginia town of Shepherdstown. Monday afternoon, September 15th, at about two or three o'clock, when we were sitting about in disconsolate fashion, distracted by the contradictory rumors, our Negro cook rushed into the room, her face working with excitement. She had been down in the 10-acre lot to pick a few ears of corn, and she had seen a long train of wagons coming up from the ford, and she said, they are full of wounded men, and the blood is running out of them that deep, measuring on her outstretched arm to the shoulder. This horrible picture sent us flying to town, 
where we found the streets already crowded, the people all astir, and the foremost wagons of what seemed an endless line discharging their piteous burdens. The scene speedily became ghastly, but fortunately we could not stay to look at it. There were no preparations, no accommodations. The men could not be left in the street. What was to be done? Here they were, unannounced, on brick pavements, and the first thing was to find roofs to cover them. Men ran for keys and opened up the shops long empty and the unused rooms. Other people got brooms and stirred up the dust of ages. The swarms of children began to appear with bundles of hay and straw taken from anybody's stable. These were hastily disposed in heaps, covered with blankets, the soldiers' own, or blankets begged or borrowed. On the Eve of an Epic Battle As night drew near, whispers of a great battle to be fought the next day grew louder, and we shuddered at the prospect, for battles had come to mean to us as they never had before, blood, wounds, and death. Wrote Federal Officer Rufus Dawes the night before Antietam, we passed over open fields and through orchards and gardens, and the men filled their pockets and empty haversacks with apples. About dusk, sharp musketry and cannonading began in our front. It was nine o'clock at night when our brigade reached the position assigned it. The men lay down upon the ground, formed in close column, muskets loaded in lines parallel with the turnpike. Once or twice during the night, Heavy volleys of musketry crashed into the dark woods on our left. There was a drizzling rain over the certain prospect of deadly conflict on the morrow. The night was dismal. Nothing could be more solemn than a period of silent waiting for the summons to battle, known to be impending. The day began overcast, but later became a cloudless, blue sky perfect day in the mid-70s. Colonel John Gordon of the 6th Alabama Regiment later wrote, It was in marked contrast with other battlegrounds. On the open plain where stood these hosts of long, hostile lines listening in silence for the signal summoning them to battle, there were no breastworks. No intervening woodlands or abrupt hills, no hiding places, no impassable streams. The space over which the assaulting columns were to march, on which was soon to occur the tremendous struggle, consisted of smooth and gentle undulations and a narrow valley covered with green grass and growing corn. From the position assigned me near the center of Lee's lines, both armies and the entire field were in view. The scene was not only magnificent to look upon, but the realization of what it meant was deeply impressive. Even in times of peace, our sensibilities are stirred by the sight of a great army passing in review. How infinitely more thrilling in the dread moments before the battle to look upon two armies upon the same plane. Then, the bloodiest day in American military history began in the dew and fog from a night rain. On the 17th of September, cloudy skies looked down upon the two armies facing each other on the fields of Maryland. It seems to me now that the roar of that day began with the light and all through its long, dragging hours, its thunder formed a background to our pain and terror. If we had been in doubt as to our friends' whereabouts on Sunday, there was no room for doubt now. There was no sitting at the windows now and counting discharges of guns or watching, as they did during the Harpers Ferry battle, the curling smoke. 
We went about our work with pale faces and trembling hands, yet trying to appear composed for the sake of our patients, who were much excited. We could hear the incessant explosions of artillery, the shrieking whistles of the shells, and the sharper, deadlier, more thrilling roll of musketry, while every now and then the echo of some charging cheer would be borne by the wind. And as the human voice pierced the demoniacal clangor, we would catch our breath and listen, and try not to sob, and turn back to the forlorn hospitals, to the suffering at our feet and before our eyes, while imagination fainted at the thought of those other scenes hidden from us beyond the Potomac. On our side of the river, there were noise, confusion, dust, throngs of stragglers, horsemen galloping about, wagons blocking each other and teamsters wrangling, and a continued din of shouting, swearing, and rumbling, in the midst of which men were dying, fresh wounded arriving, surgeons amputating limbs and dressing wounds, women going in and out with bandages, lint, medicines, food. An ever-present sense of anguish, dread, pity, and I fear hatred. These are my recollections of Antietam. There was this terrific battle. The noise was as much as the limits of possible noise could take. There were screams higher, groans deeper than any ear could hold. Many eardrums burst in some walls, collapsed to escape the noise. Everything struggled on its way through this tearing deafness, as through a torrent in a dark cave. The cartridges were banging off as planned. The fingers were keeping things going according to excitement and orders. The unhurt eyes were full of deadliness. The bullets pursued their courses through clouds of stone, earth, and skin, through intestines, pocketbooks, brains, hair, teeth, according to universal laws in the mouths, cried Mama. From sudden traps of calculus, theorems wrenched men in two, shock severed eyes watched blood squandering as from a drain pipe into the blanks between the stars. Faces slammed down into clay as for the making of a life mask, knew that even on the sun's surface they could not be learning more or more to the point. Reality was given its lesson, its mishmash of scripture and physics with here, brains and hands, for example, and their legs in the treetop. There was no escape except into death. And still it went on. It outlasted many prayers. Roughly 40,000 artillery shells were fired that day. Traveling at 1,250 feet per second, possibly 100 muskets or rifles fired every second for hours. No one ever talks about the sound. It was a day of only thunderous sound in Shepherdstown over two miles away. General Alpheus Williams wrote his wife in New York City, the roar of the infantry was beyond anything conceivable. Imagine from 8,000 to 10,000 men on one side with probably a larger number on the other all at once discharging their muskets. If all the stone and brick houses on Broadway should tumble at once, the roar and rattle could hardly be greater. And amidst this, hundreds of pieces of artillery right and left were thundering as a sort of bass to the infernal music. It's utterly incomprehensible and perfectly inconceivable how mortal men can stand and live under such an infantry fire as I heard today. Judging from the way the musketry roared, the whole surrounding air between the lines must have been thick with flying air. Cheated out of a meal by the order, General John Bell Hood's Texas Brigade charged with 
A shout as piercing as the blast of a thousand bugles across a cornfield toward federal positions in the morning. A fierce, futile charge that dropped 82% of all the soldiers on one charge in regiment. Both commanding generals were ill-informed. Lee thinking his army was closer to 70,000, not yet realizing the deep loss. Straggling. McClellan always wanted to operate on the estimate of the enemy's forces at what could charitably be called the maximum possible number. McClellan acted in a way that reflected his strange conviction that General Robert E. Lee had 100,000 men? But what enabled Lee to manage the slaughter better than McClellan was where he chose to watch things. The more inexperienced McClellan set up shop in a comfortable home two miles to the north, getting his intelligence through the lens of a telescope eyed by someone other than himself. The concluding written-down orders were then galloped out to the battlefield to the appropriate commander, often long after the orders pertained. Lee, more experienced and oblivious to personal physical risk, it would seem, watched with his hands seriously hurt and bandaged from his horse near the Hagerstown Pike on a knoll. There he was able to see emerging dangers and lateral off verbal orders directly to the intended commander. How? The two generals opted to be informed almost determined the outcome. The whole day and the war itself was coming down to a warm discussion among Generals McClellan, Sumner, and Franklin in the Federal Army on whether McClellan should make use of about 20,500 fresh undeployed men into the battle right at a time, unbeknownst to them, when Lee had virtually no reserves left and was fighting almost on pride alone. Thousands of well-led Federals closed in from the Sunken Lane area on what remained of the paltry Confederate position near Hagerstown Pike. Confederate Captain M.B. Miller double-charged his two guns with spherical case and canister, causing them to leap 10 to 12 inches into the air with each firing. With no time left, these only two brass guns remarkably brought down what observing Confederate General Longstreet called the aggressive spirit of the right column, Colonel Francis Barlow. And another shot brought down the Federal commander, General Israel Richardson. The Federal advance stalled, saving the Confederates. Lee ordered Stonewall Jackson and Jeb Stewart to probe the terrain between the extreme Union right and the riverbank of the Potomac to see if there was room to press the remnants of his army around the end of the Union line to either escape or turn the Union line. But the prompt, persuasive reply from 42 Union guns Washed that plan. Moreover, if the advancing slightly opposed Union forces crossing the Burnside Bridge totaling 8,600 men could get to the main street of Sharpsburg, then all Confederate escape routes were blocked and the entrapped Army of Northern Virginia would be defeated. Music